We're good to go. Excellent. Well, good evening, everyone. 6.30 on December 10th. I hope everyone is doing good. We appreciate everyone that is able to join us this evening. It is the North Clackamas School Board meeting via Zoom. Uh, we're excited to get our evening started. We'll start off with our native land acknowledgement, our co-chair, Director Bauer. Are you ready to go? Yes, thank you, Chair Ford. We acknowledge the land on which we sit, in which we call the North Clackamas School District. It rests on the traditional and indigenous lands and village sites of the native people of the Kalapuya, Chinook, Malala, and Clackamas. We take this opportunity to offer gratitude for the ability to learn, work, and be a community on this land. And we offer thanks to the original caretakers of this region. We recognize the historical policies of colonization, genocide, relocation, and assimilation that affected indigenous and native families, both past and present, and that will affect those in the future and honor the resilience and revitalization of our indigenous and native communities. We pay our respects to the elders, both past and present, who have been the stewards of this land throughout the generations. Thank you so much. And of course, as always, we appreciate this moment to acknowledge native land. First on the agenda is our minutes from November 12, 2020. I open the floor for a motion. Uh, Schradel, move approval of November 12th, 2020 minutes. Excellent. Do have a second? Perez, second. Excellent. It's been moved by Director Schradel, second by Director Perez. Any discussion needed? I can see you all, so if you need to. Um, great. Let's go ahead and do a roll call for our vote. Director Schradel? Aye. Director Perez? Aye. Director Bauer? Aye. Director Benaloga? Aye. Director Way? Aye. Director McVeigh? Aye. And same for me, aye. Moving on to our next uh, agenda item, which is consent agenda, employee meant changes and policy revisions. Open the floor for a motion. Benaloga, move that we approve the consent agenda. Excellent. I like your background, Benaloga. <laughs> May second. <laughs> so moved and <in> second. <laughs> any discussion that we need? Actually, we can't have any discussion about those things, can we? All right. I'm sorry. Go ahead, Director um, Schradel. Thank you, uh, Schradel. Uh, Do we have policy revisions as well in the consent agenda? Uh, yep. Did I not say that? I'm sorry. Yeah, if it if you did, I just lost uh, audio for a period of time. So, well, let's just check and make sure. Um, other can another director let me know if I missed policy revisions in my request for a motion? Or Sandra, I didn't catch it either. I just heard consent agenda with administrative and license changes. So that was your motion. Gina. Okay. So I think we're good to go. Are we comfortable? Okay. And the second was by who? McVeigh. Excellent. So let's go ahead and vote. Director McVeigh? Aye. Director Schrado? Aye. Director Perez? Aye. Director Bauer? Aye. Director Benaloga? Aye. Director Way? Aye. And myself is also I. Excellent. Moving right into our community requests. Always appreciate it when people have something to tell us and express their opinions to us. So we appreciate, I think we have two, correct, Sandra? Um, I don't know the names of them. So if someone can tell me. Yeah, this is Cindy. I'll be happy to introduce them to you. Excellent. Um, first up, we have Kathleen Johnson. Kathleen, go ahead and uh, unmute yourself and feel free to speak to the board. However, our chair may have a few guiding words before uh, you go ahead and speak. Yes, Kathleen, welcome. We do have uh, a three-minute uh, 
um, time limit. So when you get to one minute, I will go ahead and elevate this red sheet of paper that has one minute on it so you know where you are in your time. Okay, great. Yep. Thank you. Go ahead whenever you're ready. Okay. Um, good evening. My name is Kathy Johnson and um, I'm just, I wrote this down. I'm just going to read it because I think that that will be the easiest thing for me with this. Um, I wish to speak about the school boundary appeal topic that will be discussed tonight regarding the area south of Carver Bridge. I, along with many other families, have fought for the last two and a half years for our community to stay at Burn Duncan and its feeder schools. So thank you for agreeing to hear our appeal. After viewing the supporting documents, I ask that you thoughtfully consider supporting our appeal for the following reasons. Number one, there is school capacity to accommodate our children. And number two, 68% of the families approve this appeal. Number three, it's the most logical decision considering the new middle school that will be opening in the next five to seven years. And number four, the stoplight has been installed, thank goodness, at the bridge um, improving traffic flow. And number five, dishonoring our community rural values to stay in the most rural schools. Most importantly, it would allow our children to have some degree of norm at the start of next year during a current time of challenge and stress. Some things are worth fighting for, and this is one that's been very dear to my heart. Please hear the hearts of this community and vote next month to keep us at Vern Duncan. So thank you for your time, and I appreciate everything that you guys have done. Thank you so much, Kathy. Our next community member is Caitlin Long. Caitlin, go ahead and unmic yourself and you may begin. Yes, hello there. Uh, my name is Caitlin Long and my family and I are residents of the affected area south of the Carver Ridge. And I'm also requesting that you please approve the appeal to change the boundaries so our children may remain attending Vern Duncan Elementary School. I believe that it's been proven over the past few years that the initial concerns and reasons for the boundary changes are no longer relevant. The number of students in our community are minimal and should not have a major effect on enrollment. Also, as Kathy stated, the traffic light in Carver has definitely uh, helped the traffic problem substantially. So also, yay, very exciting. Um, but above all else, I'm requesting the approval for our children's sake. Um, <clears throat> because of the pandemic, our children, as you all know, have endured tremendous change and forced to be extremely flexible over the past several months. With the uncertainty of the remainder of the school year, there's a chance that our kids will not even get the opportunity to return back to Vern Duncan to see their friends and beloved staff members. Out of no one's control, they've had to spend their last year at Vern Duncan remotely and missing out on all the fun memories. Again, I ask that you please approve and um, this upcoming appeal and allow our children the opportunity to stay at Vern Duncan where they're already established and comfortable. And we thank you guys so much for the, um, and appreciate your consideration. Excellent. Thank you guys for coming. Um, I think it's always um, appreciated when people show up to our meetings and actually express their opinions. Whatever they are, we welcome them. So I appreciate you guys showing up. All right. Our next thing on our agenda is the presentation from Milwaukee El Puente Elementary School. And we have uh, Dr. Williams Rodriguez here to give us the presentation with her crew. Yes. How are you today? Good, happy Thursday. Good. Happy Good Thursday. Thank you for welcoming me and the team. We have, um, so school board members, superintendent out of back. We have the principal, uh, Ms. Ruth Tucker and our assistant principal, Mr. Gloria Okiki, prepared to share with you today all about their school. So we're excited to hear and listen. Hi, everybody. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Oh, it says that I cannot share my screen right now. We'll either make you a host or I can change a setting here real quickly. Okay. And this is what our teachers experienced sometimes. Okay. You have the option, option to share now. All right. There we go. Okay. 
Can you hear me? Okay, all right, okay. Well, hi, and thank you everybody for the opportunity to um, talk a little bit about our school. My name is Ruth Tucker, and I am the principal at Milwaukee El Puente. And here with me today is also Glory Okiki, our new assistant principal. Hey, good evening, everyone. Happy Thursday to you guys. Like Ruth said, my name is Glory Okiki, and I am the assistant principal here at Milwaukee El Puente Elementary. And I am also new to North Clackamas School District, so I've been on the job for the past five months, and I've learned a lot during that time, but uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Nice to meet you all. And as um, some of you may know, our building um, housed two different schools. Uh, it housed El Puente Dual Language Spanish Immersion Program, as well as Milwaukee, which was uh, which is a traditional full English uh, program. And so they had their own mission statement and their own values that they had developed over the years. And it became clear to me when I first joined the team in having conversations with staff and families and students that they wanted to continue to take steps into becoming a more cohesive community. And so we thought that a good way to do that would be to start the process of creating a common mission statement that represented the values that will guide us in our work together. And what you see here is some examples of charts that were co-created by all of our staff members. The dots represent keywords or phrases that they felt they were key and very important to them and they wanted to see um, embedded in our mission statement. And so we um, gathered all those dots and put them together in this wordle that you see over here. And um, we follow the same process with our families. And not surprisingly, our families' dots were very much aligned with the dots from our staff. It was um, key that we remain a community, that our students feel emotionally safe and physically safe, rigorous academics, um, diversity, and value cultural responsive um, instruction. So as a result of our school merge this year, uh, at the end of June, we are now in the position of taking the next steps towards having a Milwaukee El Puente Elementary mission statement. And I'm gonna let Glory guide you through the work that we took this, um, this summer or August at the beginning of the school year because we wanted to reconnect with the work that we had done at the same time that we welcome the voice and the perspective of the new members who join our, our team because we also wanted them to feel represented in this set of values. So Ruth, if you want to go and click on the link, fantastic. Got so it. as we said, we uh, merged the two schools together and we, we knew it was very important that the staff had a chance to really think and reflect on the values they wanted to see reflected in our school. And so we broke our staff up into four different groups and each group uh, came up with their own type of mission statement for what they wanna see, what values they wanna see reflected um, in our school and how they want us to um, best reach our students and our families. And what's interesting about what you're looking at is um, this is a Jamboard. Uh, so this is a device where uh, our staff use to, you can see post their thoughts on these digital post-it notes. And because we're in CDL and everything we're doing is technologically based, this also provided our staff with a great chance to practice what they can use uh, with our students. So many of our students um, use this device just about every day to post their thoughts, ask questions, um, et cetera. So Ruth, if you go back to the main slide now, um, you'll see that you have the four mission statements. And so then what I, what I did is I, I took those four statements, I compiled them uh, into this world that you're looking at, and you can see the different values and um, um, just yeah, different values and, and characteristics that our staff feel was the most important for our school. And not surprisingly, you'll notice that a lot of it aligns very much so with the same values that our families have for our school, such as um, students being valued, um, students having a sense of belonging, as well as rigorous academic expectations. So it, it was great to do this exercise and to see how uh, the voice of our staff aligned with the voice of our families. 
And so at our school, uh, social and emotional learning and instruction have always been uh, areas of focus and they have evolved over time. So we continue to move the school forward in that direction. So we, um, starting last year, we began professional learning communities in the areas of math. And so what that meant is that teachers who were from both programs worked together, looking at standards, assessments, and students' work to plan for math. We also took um, a little bit farther our literacy planning, making sure that we were planning for differentiated instruction as well as interventions that were being monitored during our data teams. Because we wanted to make sure and monitor that the interventions that we were actually choosing and putting in place were working for our students in a timely manner. And we also continue our work on trauma-informed practices and social and emotional learning. We work with um, Mary Claire Warnocott, who is our Title I social and emotional learning coach in the district. And she has guided our, our team now for, um, for several years on these best practices. And so she continued to do so this year. And she helped us create and facilitate a school climate team that allowed us to kind of take um, take stock of how, how we were doing as a, um, as a school climate wise. And then we created action steps, um, long-term and short-term. So over the summer, we have, in our school, we have a building advisory team and that is made out of classified and licensed staff who meets regularly with admin. And we didn't know what ODE was gonna, share with us. We didn't know what the plans were going to be for the district, but what we did know is that we wanted to remain true to who we said we wanted to be as a school. And so we, um, we had these four commitments that we, we, we committed to, to make sure that alongside ODE guidelines and alongside North Clackamas Comprehensive Distance Learning Planning, we didn't let go of those four um, values for us. And so we continue to strive to provide high quality instruction. Comprehensive distance learning is very hard, is really challenging. And our teachers are working every day extremely hard to make sure that that is not a barrier to our high quality instruction. And we also know that connection and care, especially now, it's very important. When we discuss this as a team, we thought about it not only between teachers and students, but also among staff members and with our families. We also wanted to make sure that our communication was two-way communication and that we included families, staff members, and students. And we also wanted to remain committed, committed to our equity work because um, it's not always a comfortable work is often challenging. And of course, CDL adds a, another layer to it. However, we don't wanna let that go. So we recommitted to continuing that work. So what that looks like when we're working with our staff is that we are maintaining a team approach and that is every single person in our building. So for instance, we have professional development for our instructional assistants on reading, math and technology every Wednesday. So they have the tools and the strategies that they need to support our teachers and students in a small group. We remain committed to the math PLC that we had started last year. We continue to hold, to hold those on a monthly basis. And both Gloria and I hold each other accountable to make sure that when we have meetings, whether it's a PLC or a staff meeting, that we make space for connection. Because as a principal, um, we always have a list of things that we wanna share and information that we wanna get across, but, um, and it's tempting. But we, we are remaining um, accountable to making space for connection among our teachers and highlighting each other's strength. So for this year, our professional development focus has been student engagement. Obviously, it was um, a concern of ours that we had for comprehensive distance learning. So we've been looking at different ways in which students can interact with the teacher, but also among themselves and how language development, social and academic can help support this student engagement. We also maintain our uh, focus on social and emotional learning best practices. 
especially during our morning meetings, but also our we're, we're trying to embed those strategies during a uh, whole class lesson and during small group so that kids feel that connection with the adults that they're working with. And in regards to assessments and data teams, we knew that it, it, this was gonna be different and we wanted our teachers to have as much information as possible. This is something we're learning together about. How can we give our kids feedback that is timely and it's effective so that they themselves see themselves grow from point A to point B in their academic achievement? So not only for our staff, but we wanted to find a way to make sure we were connecting with our families. So in the beginning of the year, we sent out a um, needs survey essentially asking our families, what do they need in order to access CDL or what barriers um, are they encountering that's keeping them and, and their, and their uh, children from accessing um, CDL. And out of that, we created a Cafe Comunitario monthly where parents can come in and just kind of uh, voice their concerns as well as what's working well. We offer parent workshops where we talk about, um, again, CDL support, um, what they can do at home, to increase attention and focus and how to emotionally regulate themselves as well as their kids. Um, we also obviously have a school newsletter. And one thing I'm really proud of, we uh, really steer a lot of parents to this Milwaukee El Puente Family Support Center. And that is a place for families and students to go in and get individual uh, tech help, especially. Uh, many of our families, the, this is the first time they've had to really work on a computer or from a computer to this extent. And it was very challenging for them, but for some of our students as well. So getting that one-on-one -on -one tech help has proved vital. And then last, I just wanna highlight the parent-teacher organization. Um, and that allows us, uh, that, where they help facilitate social connections among families outside of school in a virtual way. So um, just understanding that this is a, a challenging time for our families. We wanna make sure that we are providing as many resources as possible to help them access and to feel secure doing so. And of course, when we talk about care and connection, the kids are at the heart of all of it really. So we are building in our schedule opportunities for them to just socially talk to each other, like in the breakfast clubs or lunch bunches. We, uh, we're also starting class representatives because quite honestly, we, we, we're always sending surveys and asking families and staff how things are going, but really the kids are the ones who are experiencing CDL um, more, more closely. So we, Lori and I really wanted to hear what's working, what's not working. And we wanted to give them an opportunity to help us plan events um, celebrations so that even though we're not close physically, we can, they can feel like they're connected to school and they have ownership of their community. Our morning meetings continue to follow social emotional learning um, best practices. And we started our care team. The care team meets every Tuesday and we look at our student engagement forms. And if we notice that there's students whose engagement is uh, dipping or is at risk of being, um, being disengaged, then we put a plan together to make sure that no student falls through the cracks. Uh, and finally, we're also continuing our alliance and affinity groups that we started last year. And so I don't want to end without telling you just how really proud I am to be working with this team. And when I say team, I really mean every staff member, but also our families, comprehensive distance learning. I mean, I'm a mom and I'm working and it's really, really hard. And I know how much they are working together with our teachers to make sure that our students have the best possible year that they can. And I'm very thankful for that because this has brought the best in our community. Collaboration, connection, it's better than it has ever been. Student engagement is higher than we expected. Kids are coming, kids are learning, and they continue to come back. And this is because our teachers are being so creative and they are demonstrating such resilience. Um, I have to say they they're learn new things every day and they try them right away. And that's really, it's a vulnerable place to be because we are in people's homes. So they have a wide you know, audience of 
to see how things are working or not working. So I'm really proud of our Milwaukee El Puente staff the teachers, our main office, our bus drivers, our custodians, our instructional assistants, who they have all the step up to do things that maybe they were not part of the role, but they have done so happily so that together as a community, we make sure that our kids succeed this year. And um, I already said what I'm proud of, but I thought um, you should hear from our students because students' voices are always the best. And so this is a short video um, of our kids telling you, sharing with you what do they love the most about Milwaukee El Puente and why is it so special to them. No, me, no me Escuela porque aprendo, quiero aprender más y quiero hacer todo, todo lo que puedo y quiero aprender y quiero uh, jugar con mis amigos y todos, que, y todos mis amigos. Something that I um, like about school this year is seeing my friends even though we can't see them in person. Just I like to see them on my calls and stuff. and I like doing math. Hello, my favorite thing about the school is my principal and all the kids at my school and the teachers who work so hard every day to be able to teach us online. It makes our school special and um, is that we're bilingual and I really like our school because we get to read, and I really like reading a lot. I like to read in Spanish and English. A mí me gusta la, el matemáticas y lectura y escritura. What I like in the what I like in the school is the big park that has so much bigness and it's so cool. I mean, total cool. Hi, Mrs. Tucker. Hola, maestra. Y lo que a mí me gusta de la escuela, lo que me gusta mucho es cuando hacemos las tareas. Y bye. Eso es todo lo que me gusta del Mahuac y el Puente. Cuando hacemos conferencias y cuando nos da cosas y actividades. Bye. Hi. Uh, I was... Uh, this year is special because it's uh, we have to be home and it's like so sh and I'm really excited to learn and I'm really I'm, and I'm really excited just to at least see people maybe maybe it's not in person but you know at least I can see them. Hola, yo soy Gemma y algo que me gusta mucho este año es Mi maestro, que es Maestro Guerrero, porque él es muy, es muy kind y, lo, y también me gusta Friday Free Time porque puedo hablar y jugar con tus amigos. Y es esto. Adiós. La cosa en Moapi, en Puente, que yo me gusta es las maestras y maestros haciendo todo lo puedo hacer a las estudiantes. Um, one thing I might like about school this year might be um, one that it's a little shorter, but also I'm using I'm learning about technology as well. Hola, hi, my name is Abdel, and uh, what I like about school is math, my principal, my teacher, and well, my friends from the class because I'm glad they're my friends. Something that I really like about this year in school is that um, we're learning more uh, and about like technology. Yeah. Hello everybody. So what I think 
what I love from the school is that like you get to hang out with your friends, yeah. <clears throat> maybe learn new subjects. What I like about the school is that everyone is unique and what I like most is that we're bilingual and like everyone is invited to the school. And what I like most is seeing my friends at, at an online school. And I love my teacher. Hello, this is Evelyn. Um, I really like about the school is the math. It's very fun. And I really like the weeding. I, I like to listen to the weeding. It's really detailed. Mis tías, una cosa que me gusta sobre la escuela este año es, uh, me gusta los flip grids. Hi, everybody. <coughs> what I like about school most is that they give us little breaks and that they I like the, how they, in my classroom, that they uh, give us groups to understand more about math. Great. Best part of our job, for sure. Um, so that is the end of our presentation for today, uh, but we are here if you have any questions that you may have for us. Excellent. Well, thank you so much, Ms. Tucker um, and Mr. Gloria. Are either of you doctors, am I missing out on something, an opportunity to call you the proper thing? Okay. Um, thank you very much for that. I do know that I already love you, um, Ms. Tucker, because you use a Mac. I just want to say that. <laughs> um, <laughs> and Glory, I think that when we met you the first time you were having, you just had a baby, am I correct? That's correct. Uh, my son is three and a half months old now. Excellent. Well, welcome to you again and welcome that newborn baby. Great presentation. I'm going to rotate around, call you guys out. If you could... Um, uh undo the presentation so i can see every perfect cool i'll rotate around call you guys remember that if you don't have something to say it's okay you're not it's not a test we're not grading you but of course we love to hear mm -hmm. your comments because that was a great presentation so uh director way what you got for us um i don't have any questions i just want to extend just a lot of praise and gratitude um for you ruth and um and just so many of our other teachers and administrators for really sort of leading and modeling what um community care and student uh voice can look like especially in this um you know virtual time um so there's a quote that i wanted to to um that sort of struck me this week um, it says our students are not falling behind they are trying to learn in a pandemic um so i just you know have been trying to really think about just you know what this effect of the pandemic has mean for our students and our community and you all, you know, behind the screens trying to educate our kids and thank you so much for continuing to stay on and be persistent and um, working through all the challenges. Thank you. I love that quote. They are living life to the fullest. <laughs> all right, Director Shredo, what you got for us? I just want to say, uh, echo everything that uh, Director we're losing add in those videos of the kids a uh, great presentation thank you thank you director Fredo. director mcveigh a great presentation principal ruth tucker it's always great to hear from you and as uh, i love all the kids but you never know what's going to come out of their mouth i think it's just hysterical Ooh. sometimes but as i was watching the presentation i was thinking of like how you know uh, the pandemic, how, what it, how it affects me personally. And I started thinking like, wow, a new administrator being onboarded and to build relationships and to have to build new relationships through technology where you don't, at least 
at least, uh, uh, if you, I can say, teachers have the day-to-day interaction with their kids and think how Glory is going to do that with both teachers and parents and kids and like uh, more power to you. So I can't wait for uh, to meet you in person and to uh, start building a relationship with you also. But uh, welcome to Milwaukee. Thank you. Thank and you. have fun with that three-month-old. I will. <laughs> <laughs> well. It's it's actually a gift that you're starting online with a newborn baby. That's kind of <laughs> dope, actually. <Yeah. laughs> you get to be home. True. Well, it's, been home. A, it's been a year of transition for sure. So absolutely. Director Perez. Bear with me. I'm I'm still at work here at the hospital, so and there's folks around I have to wear a mask, but I just want to say that um uh that touched very touching presentation just how it's everything it just seems like a vibrant uh, atmosphere there and just how you uh, have created this village uh, and you've involved you've included everybody I think at one point uh, Ruth I heard you say kids are at the heart of this and um, and when you create a village with all the programs that you have the parent workshops and all the all the different things you got going on and you just you're, you're keeping that uh, village in, in, intact or, or connected, and um, and kids can thrive in a in a caring village like that, and, and families can thrive, and um, it, it it warms my heart, makes my heart happy to see that. Um, so awesome job, uh, Ruth and Glory. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you, Director Benaloga. Yes, thank you so much for the presentation. The, uh, I love seeing the kids. That's my favorite part of, of all of them. So we appreciate that. Um, I also just wanted to say that, again, we, we're just seeing so much positivity come out of our schools. And I truly believe that so many of uh, our districts, so many people are really taking this obstacle and turning it into such an opportunity. And it comes through how much you care about your kids and your staff and your family and your community. And uh, very proud to have you all with us at North Clackamas. So thank you. Enjoyed it very much. Thank you. Director Bauer. Gosh, I can't um, add too much. Every, I agree with what all of my uh, previous board members have said. Great presentation. Um, and love the kids. Um, thank you for your efforts, especially in communication and um, creative work, hard work, and your work on one mission statement. I think that is important. Um, and I did note there were more than two or three that said they liked math. So I'm very impressed that you're able to get those concepts concepts across. And, and that's the beginning of really learning math is enjoying and someone said fun. So thank you for that, all of your efforts. The teachers, they're magical. It's the mm -hmm. teachers. Thank you, Director Bauer. And uh, it, you know, there's some trickery in that, I must tell you, Ms. Tucker, Tucker, because Director Bauer was a math teacher. So she's ah. listening intently on purpose. <laughs> I can't now. Uh, so my only, I have two comments, well, three comments and one, two comments and one question. So my first comment is, um, I really appreciated the virtual numbers, like how many kids from your specific school are in the online um, portion of our, our, our school options. I thought that was really helpful. So I appreciate you putting that in there. And then the other um, comment I have is uh, the presentations. I appreciated the students that took that leap and um, may not have had Spanish as their native language, but as a presenter did that. I will tell you as a child, I went to a music school and we were required to play a second instrument. We hated it, but it was a, it, it forces you into something, into your skill. And so I really appreciated that, that effort by the kids. And the, the last question I have for you is, as a new principal, and not just a new principal, but also our new assistant principal, and both of you being principals, assistant and principal of color, um, what do you need from us? I, um, I like, I'm gonna, tell, I'm gonna tell you what I, I feel that I can do my job. I feel that in, in Especially um, sometimes I may be worried or scared that I'm going to uh, approach uh, a situ an equity situation or a social justice situation. And I may be worried that I'm not gonna say the right thing 
do the right thing. And I hear very clearly from, um, from Kalia, from Matt, from really everybody in, in our district, very clear at all levels that it is not only expected that I do that, but even if I make a mistake, it's okay, but it's not okay not to do it. And so that has freed me to, to just, you know, be bolder and say, okay, well, we're going to do this work together. So I, I feel like I have that. And I feel like I have a, a team of people that I can reach out when I need help. Our elementary principals are, as a newcomer, I felt supported and help and, um, I feel very grateful to be here. And that's the truth. It's not because they're here. I'm telling you, I'm being honest. Uh, well, for me, I can just say that um, the district's stance on equity and, and social justice is what drew me into this district in the first place. And um, I have not been disappointed. And every time um, I, I read something that um, I puts out or the district puts out, um, about our stance on equity, it's very encouraging. And so I think as, as building leaders, right, our, our goal is to, 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 you know, try to move our staff right in that direction. Some are farther along, you know, they all have different journeys. And so, you know, um, just any, anything that we can continue to get from you guys, whether it's trainings or just things that our staff can access, read resources that can um, just help them in that journey would be greatly appreciated um, because I know that that's where the district wants all of us to to move towards and I appreciate that. Excellent. I appreciate you guys answering that and I put you on the spot, but anytime you come up with something that you do need, I hope that you feel free to ask. Um, um, it is an important part of this district. We don't want to lose that important part and we also want to um, attract more uh, so that we need we need all the good, the bad, and indifferent in order to do that. So I appreciate you guys sharing your thoughts. I uh, thank you for your time, and we are moving on. You guys are free to go. You can stay and hang out with us. It's up to you. <laughs> I, got a, I got a three month old at home. <laughs> oh, see, look at that. See. <laughs> thank you. Enjoy. You guys have a good night. Bye. All right. Next on our agenda is our um, superintendent's report. Are you counting down how many more of these you have, Matt? <laughs> yeah. Um, but good evening, everyone, board members, uh, district staff uh, that's watching tonight, and community members. Uh, it's always a pleasure to share um, with the community and district staff uh, what's uh, going on in the school district. So I have uh, several updates to share with you all tonight. Uh, first, kind of regarding the district's delivery models, uh, and then a little bit on uh, next year's budget, and uh, then a grant award uh, that uh, we should celebrate. So first, I'd like to take a look at the latest health metrics uh, for Clackamas County. Um, and as a reminder to our community, school districts can begin looking at elementary hybrid model uh, once the county metrics uh, indicate less than 100 COVID-19 positive cases per 100,000 residents. And in addition, when the test positivity rate drops below 8%. So both of these metrics are factored over the two previous weeks. And this week's two week look back in Clackamas County reported 455 cases per 100,000 residents. And the test positivity rate was about 8.3%. So the reason I share that, we continue to communicate this out weekly uh, to our staff on our community is because based on these numbers, uh, North Clackamas schools will continue in comprehensive distance learning uh, for the foreseeable future. Um, not only in our week, those 455 cases, uh, that number just uh, for the last uh, numerous weeks has just continued to climb. Uh, so certainly what we're seeing both locally, statewide, nationally, as, as we're seeing it here in Clackamas County as well. I'd also like to remind folks that, um, as I, know, I think at our November board meeting, uh, we continue to pause on piloting uh, limited in-person instruction until those weekly COVID-19 positivity cases are consistently below 200 cases per 100,000. Um, so our hope is, is that uh, we can begin to get this pandemic uh, under control and to start to see those numbers drop and 
uh, we're eager to, to start to bring a limited number of students back onto our campuses uh, in that limited in-person instruction. But I think, again, I think we've got a few weeks, maybe a, a couple months before we can do that. Uh, last week, we started our second three-week session of high school after school outdoor athletic training and conditioning. And I'm really happy to report that it has gone really well. Um, we um, are really following those safety protocols and procedures, and it's been a healthy experience for our students. But last week, uh, we had about 725 high school students um, participate across all three of our neighborhood high schools uh, in those after school uh, athletic training and conditioning. Uh, sessions. And obviously, those are just great opportunities for our students to socialize uh, and to gain some physical activity. Both, you know, uh, both areas we know are really important to our students' uh, overall uh, well-being. Uh, all that being said, and where we are, we are continuing and planning uh, regarding the design of an elementary hybrid model. And we recently completed a parent survey that I've spoken about previously of all of our elementary families uh, asking for their feedback regarding their comfort level in moving uh, back into school in a hybrid model, uh, if and when we can do that, or their desire to remain in comprehensive distance learning. And uh, through this incredible work of our staff, um, we're at somewhere probably between 85 and 90% of the feedback we've gotten from those families, which is incredible. Uh, the survey showed that about two thirds of our families of elementary students uh, would, want it, would want to uh, move into a hybrid model, again, if it uh, becomes available, and a third of our families uh, would choose to uh, remain in comprehensive distance learning. And that's really valuable data for us as we begin uh, to continue to plan what that uh, transition could look like. So I wanna thank our families who completed the survey uh, and or uh, picked up the phone when we called and, and asked you some questions. So again, I think given the current status, I think it's important for our community to understand that um, we're likely many, many weeks uh, or perhaps uh, some months away from initiating that elementary hybrid model unless uh, the state would come along and, and change the metrics again. Okay. Um, as many of you know, uh, last week, the governor uh, released her proposed budget uh, for the 2021-2023 biennium. And overall, uh, the budget prioritized investments in early learning uh, and in the full distribution of the Student Success Act, which was uh, exciting. Uh, specifically for K-12, the major shortfall in the governor's proposal was in the state school fund. Uh, and the governor did acknowledge in her presentation that her proposed investment is insufficient to meet the needs of school districts. Our view is that the proposed budget does reflect a prioritization of K-12 funding and key investments by the governor and her team. Uh, that there is uh, lots of evidence of that. And we know we have some work to do to get that state school fund number up. Uh, but we have been successful in the past, as you all know, at the legislative level uh, to make that happen. So just some key specifics regarding her budget. Um, 9.1 billion is what she's proposing for the state school fund. So that compares to our current funding level of 9 billion. So it's up only 100 million, which is uh, obviously a percent there. Uh, in our very early analysis, um, we are estimating that we need upwards of about 9.4 to 9.5 billion in the state school fund allocation to maintain our current service levels really as we had projected last year uh, and uh, the additional staffing needed to open uh, Adrian C. Nelson High School. Uh, the Student Success Act and the Student Investment Account are fully funded in the governor's proposal at about $779 million. Uh, Measure 98, or also known as the High School Success Act, is also fully funded at $315 million. And then in the area of early learning, the governor uh, is proposing the addition of 8,000 slots 
uh, for early learning programs, uh, which is exciting uh, to see. And that started in her in the budget uh, two years ago, and we're seeing that continue moving forward. The governor's budget, uh, probably more than any budget that I've seen in my time in education, includes a number of K-12 equity focused investments. Uh, and you really see that equity and an equity lens embedded in the entire budget. But for education, uh, it includes the expansion of school nutrition through the Student Success Act funds. Um, the African American Black Student Success Plan uh, is seeing increased funding. Uh, the American Indian Alaska Native uh, Success Plan is being funded. Uh, the Latinx, uh, Latino, and Latina Student Success Plan receiving funding, as is the LGBTQ2SIA Student Success Plan. Uh, there's resources in the governor's budget for growing and diversifying the workforce, including grow your own programs, uh, non-traditional pathways to edu education, educator licensure uh, is funded. Uh, there's resources for anti-racism uh, initiatives and Indigenous Educator Institute uh, through the uh, Early Educator Advancement Council. And um, there's resources for youth re-engagement programs. So overall, a uh, very positive budget for K-12, uh, really with the exception of that state school fund that uh, we will uh, start uh, aligning our messaging and uh, our legislative efforts to see if we can increase that state school fund uh, by a couple hundred million dollars. And then finally, uh, just some really positive news uh, in addition to the other pieces that I uh, shared there with the budget. Um, last week, we received word from Clackamas County and the Oregon Department of Transportation that Clackamas County is gonna receive a $1.97 million grant from uh, ODOT to construct sidewalks, buffered bike lanes, lighting ramps, and a center pedestrian refuge island in the area around Billquist Elementary School as part of the state's Safe Routes to School program. Uh, the school, the school district, and the Clackamas County have been advocating for these improvements for the past several years. And uh, we're excited that construction uh, will be designed really to increase student safety for walking along Clackamas and Webster Roads, which if you drive by those, they are in desperate need of improvement. Uh, and so kudos to uh, uh, all those folks that played a role in getting those dollars secured. Like I said, it was a multi-year effort uh, to do that and we're really excited. So that concludes my report and I will take any questions if board members have any. Thank you, Matt. Super amazing information. Appreciate that. Okay, I'll rotate. Uh, Director Schrado, anything? Nothing for me. Thank you. Excellent. Director Perez? Uh, nothing uh, for me, Chair. Thank you, Superintendent. Thank you. Director Bauer? Thank you, Superintendent, for all that information. Just two um, quick questions. One is, is there any um, assistance for summer school um, that, you know, closing that gap at all for academics? Is there anything in there at all yet? No, I, I haven't seen that in the governor's budget uh, where I think there's hope uh, for, uh, you know, some COVID closing the gap relief. Uh, for our students uh, would come from the federal government uh, in the form of another, um, you know, COVID relief uh, package. And so we're, we're hopeful that either this week or when they get back from uh, the holiday break that uh, Congress can, can get a, a bill passed that would, would help uh, with some summer school efforts for us. And then actually I have two other, um, the 8,000, for early learning, that's across the whole state. What does that mean for our district approximately? Well, it's hard to say yet. Yeah, I, 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 I wouldn't know what, yeah, what, how many that, that relates to, so. And yeah. then the 9.4 to 9.5 is just to get to current service level, correct? It to, yeah, it gets us to our current service level of what we budgeted, right? We, we budgeted thinking we were obviously gonna be in session all year long. Yeah. So yeah. it's returning us to that level and the additional staffing that will be needed to open Adrian C. Nelson High School. Yeah, so we have some work to do. Thank we you. have some work to do. We always do uh, when the governor's budget comes out. Yeah. Great, thank you. You're welcome. 
Um, okay, Director Beneloga. Thank you, Superintendent, for the report. I don't have any questions. Sorry, Director McBay. I'm good, thanks. Awesome, Director Way. I just have one question. Thank you so much, Superintendent Utterback, um, just for all of the thorough updates. Um, just can you explain um, any role that we're playing in contact tracing? Yeah, um, that's a that's a great question. So anytime you enter a district facility, uh, you are required to fill out basically a contract tracing form uh, that asks, you know, when, who you are, um, where did you go in that building? Uh, when did you sign in? When did you leave? And then there are, I think, five or six questions really, you know, do you have a fever? Do you have a, you know, a cough? Have you traveled outside Oregon in the last 14 days? All those questions. Um, those forms are collected. And then when we have uh, somebody who tests positive and or somebody who thinks uh, they were exposed, it, we now have that window of whether either it's hours or days or weeks of uh, folks that could possibly have been impacted by that uh, individual that has the virus. And we honestly use those reports every single day. So as you can imagine with 2000 employees, uh, we you know, are, are seeing just like the rest of the uh, area, you know, we're having employees who are uh, getting the virus or are exposed to someone who had the virus and we've got folks that are isolating and quarantining. Um, Director Way, did you have any other questions? No, um, I just appreciate that. And I know that, um, uh, you know, because I think public health resources have also been really stretched and, and just barely hanging in there. I'm just really grateful that um, our school district and many other school districts across Oregon, but ours is very intentional about um, protecting the public health of our students and teachers and faculty. So thank you for, yeah. um, for mentioning I that. And, I, you know, and obviously, you know, it's a requirement to wear a mask. Uh, we are encouraging folks to work at home as much as possible. Um, and, you know, so following all of those uh, safety protocols and guidelines as well um, really goes a long way into, you know, keeping not only our staff safe, but our community as well. Cool. Thank you, Superintendent. I just want to say a couple things um, about your report. I appreciate all the information. Um, Director Bauer, your question about the early education spread, um, it'll be based on the um, city. Um, just so you guys know, I was on the Education Recovery Committee, which um, represented well. Obviously, that's why you see kind of all these areas. There was someone from all those areas in the meeting. Um, but yeah, so the distribution will be based on um, populations um, and they have a formula that they've come up with for that. Um, okay, uh, I think that that's it. Are you good, Superintendent? Perfect, thank you for your report. Next we have board reports. Drum roll please, because you guys are just so awesome. <laughs> Direct away, what you got for us? Um, thank you, Chair Ford. I, I just have one major thing that I'd like to update on and this actually, um, flows in nicely with what Superintendent Utterback just shared in his report. So um, I got voted in um, unanimously to be the Clackamas representative um, on the LPC, which is the Legislative Policy Committee, uh, which is a part of OSBA, Oregon School Boards Association, for folks who um, may not be familiar with all these acronyms. And I'm very excited. Um, it's gonna be um, you know, a lot of very important work, um, particularly to really advocate for the school funding that we need that, um, um, that um, you know, we know that there's a significant shortfall. So there, there's a lot of, I think, excitement and interest in, in how we can really fully fund our schools, especially for next year. Um, so I'm excited. And I also just wanna give a shout out to um, Mitzi and Gina and so many other folks, Orlando, um, basically anyone who has lobbied before in the in the Capitol um, and have really showed up um, to advocate for North Clackamas and our needs. Thank you so much. Um, again, I look forward to this and um, I look also forward to working with any other board members who might be interested in also continuing to advocate um, at the state level. 
That was slick. She threw you guys' names out there, so I'm just saying. <laughs> All right, Director Perez. And just for clarity, so um, Director Way was voted in for the remainder of this term. So later on, you're going to see it come back again. I don't want you guys to be confused. It's for the next term. The re remainder of this term is only to the end of this year. So just to be clear. All right, uh, Director McVeigh, what you got for us? I um, just want to, uh, in the spirit of the holidays, uh, remind everyone Clackamas and Putnam already had their canned food drive. The Milwaukee, you still have an opportunity to participate uh, December 15th. Uh, between 12 and 7, you can go to the backside of the high school uh, near the gym and in the roundabout and deliver uh, canned food. To, uh, for the Elks and Lions Club delivery in the community. So it's not too late to give and I'm sure families will really appreciate it. So that's on December 15th. Thank you for that. Excellent yeah. information. Uh, Director Benaloga. Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, so we did some virtual events and, and OSBA, of course, it's always uh, wonderful just to see uh, faces and learn so much and see familiar faces that I've been uh, meeting these last couple of years. So that was nice. Uh, and um, just wanted to shout out to two things, the Rao collaboration, again, uh, Harry and uh, the Rao team has that meeting on Mondays, truly amazing, the community and uh, the support that they get and the round table that's brought to that meeting. I think it's, um, I think it's definitely um, a model for how you build that village and how you build the community. It's truly uplifting to go to those meetings. And um, I also wanna mention the wellness committee and Megan Lee, who is our wellness director, she's truly amazing. Uh, Orlando and I uh, volunteered for uh, the Q&A room um, during the benefit fair, the last hour of the fair. She's amazing. Her energy is amazing. But one of the things I just want the committee and uh, the community and the board to know is you know, Megan really... Um, and that committee really puts the wellness and the health of our staff at the forefront in everything that they do. Uh, Megan has uh, worked directly with our employee assistance program and uh, worked out a different, uh, a different set of circumstances where um, now our employees can have eight visits if they are having um, a if they need counseling or mental health issues or just want to talk to someone, they have eight visits now instead of six. And I really think that uh, Megan and that wellness committee just does, does their best to really advocate and do what they can for our staff. They truly listen. And uh, it's, it's really a great uh, committee that we have. And she's a wonderful leader. So I just want to shout out to her. And Michael Rawls as well. He's involved with both of those things and uh, fearless leader and always appreciate the guidance. Thank you, Director Benaloga. Uh, Director Bauer. Thank you, Chair Ford. Um, I would uh, like to continue on with the advocacy because a lot has been going on and um, there's three fronts of things happening through OSBA with Kathy and Libra and their roles there. But um, the PCLA is also doing some work with an event um, planned for Tuesday, January 12th at 7 p.m., a virtual event to find out more about the state of our schools and then to get the message. And the message is formulated through our district um, and the superintendent and his staff. And that effort is led by um, Tiffany Sherman. And we had I'm on that committee and we had one meeting that um, is a lot of work. Um, what she and her staff have done is organize a committee of staff and community and then reached out for groups um, in the community for further input with a thought exchange. Now she's bringing that back. Um, next week we'll have a follow-up meeting, draft a legislative plan, and then that will come to the board for your input approval. And that's the message that with the PCLA, we will take down to Salem. 
so that other virtual event will be getting the message out and, and helping our community get behind as one big partnership and getting our message down there. The other um, effort is just this week and last week, <clears throat> there might be a special session. And so this is an opportunity for call to action to be a voice for um, addressing some liability protections that can be very hurtful financially to our district. So it's very easy to write letters through the OSBA, there's help and the PCLA. So please look at those and see if you can join um, or write a letter. Um, two other things, Madres is continuing and we have, I, I really want to brag about the efforts there in leadership that we have two Madre members that are joining our steering committee on PCLA. We need their voice, it's so important. And um, they are willing to bravely um, join our, our group and uh, lend their voice and their life experiences. So that I think is a real testament to the um, help we have through the district too, the social workers there and um, people that are working with the group. And then one last thing about math, I can't pass this up, um, a real shout out to our staff and all the hard work that they're doing. I just experienced a small piece of trying to tutor one student in math. And that was so difficult to explain our work and to show our work, I'm working backwards. So I just can't imagine more than one student trying to teach them. So thank you so much to staff and efforts and all that you're doing to get the education across and students and parents for their help. Excellent, thank you. Director Perez. Yeah, thank you, Chair. And normally you pick me first. I was ready to, to, to give some uh, uh, comments on Madras de Corazon, Raw Community Collaboration, Wellness Committee, PCLA, but it's all, it's all been covered. So I'll just echo what they all said, but I will say though, um, echo uh, Director Beneloga, Megan Lee, Wellness Committee, uh, very, very dedicated, very committed. Uh, to the wellness of everyone in the district. Uh, she's awesome. Um, it's been a pleasure to, to attend those meetings and, um, and see her, her efforts at work. Um, PCLA, Mitzi covered that, Director Barr covered that pretty, pretty uh, thoroughly. Raw community collaboration. Uh, I think it's been Mitzi, Gina and I attending those. And I, I mean, Gina, uh, Director Benaloga hit it on the nose there too, just, what uh, the social worker Harry Applebaum has done in creating that village there and, and getting all those resources to come together and to talk and how to help one another and to, to support one another to, to ultimately benefit and serve the students and families. That is something that we need to see in all our schools. Um, that's a beautiful model and it continues to grow. There was another two members at the most recent uh, Rao community collaboration. Also, I've been, Mitzi and I have been attending the Madres de Corazon. I've uh, been hitting that every Monday, 12.30. And uh, it's been a delight to be part of that and uh, practicing my Spanish. Um, and also it was, it was kind of, uh, I have to share this one moment that made me feel kind of, it's always nice to hear that thank you. One of the moms said, thank you. One of the discussions we, they had asked about Spanish resources and getting library cards. And I had called all the libraries and reached out to all the libraries. And we got this Spanish resource page. And I think it's up on the district website now. But the, the librarians all came together and they sent me this, this how, to, how to get a card, in, all in Spanish, how to get a book, how to use these education. And, and one of the moms reached out and said, thank you. And it, it was, it, but that's what it's all about, right? We're all part of this. And, for the kids, I mean, but to hear that, thank you. And um, so, yeah, I, uh, it just was nice to hear that. Um, and that's all, thank you. Excellent, thank you. Director Fredo. I have no board report, thank you. Okay, I just have a few things. So uh, uh, one, I just wanna appreciate all the board members uh, for everything that you do. 
on and off the court, meaning on and off our Zoom, you know what I mean. But um, I appreciate you guys. It's um, it's a it's a big undertaking, especially during a big time. And like I always say, it's hard work because it matters. So I appreciate you guys. Um, like I said earlier, I spent some time on the Education Recovery Committee. We're still not done. It's a government uh, governor committee where we all kind of come together and try to give her um, some opinions about at that time is her budget. We'll still be meeting on some other things. Um, also attended the OSBA conference like some folks talked about. That was fun. Um, and as an OSBA board member, I was able to host the round table for the district and that was fun my first time. And it was virtual, so it was interesting, but it was fun. I um, got a lot of information about what's going on in our district and well, not our district, but in our region, which is so vast and with so many different needs. Um, and, you know, just trying to figure out how everyone gets what they need is, um, it's an interesting task. Um, had the opportunity to take my daughter to Sabin to pick up her, um, uh, what is she taking? Cosmetology package. And I just um, was so, I was really, really pleased by what I saw and also reminded just how much work is happening in our district. There were rows and rows of perfectly packaged bags with the kids' names on each one. And, uh, you know, you walk in, it's super easy, super organized. Um, but it was just so touching to see how the personal touches were done. So just appreciate you guys. I know it's different. I know that our buildings right now are big storage centers, <laughs> but they're storing good stuff. And she was pretty excited to see her name on it. And um, so just well done stuff there. And last but not least, um, I got a, a little something from OSBA for all of you people that don't know what that is, Oregon School Board Association. There is a need for um, MESD, -E which is the Multnomah Educational, well, I don't know the acronyms, you guys can Google that. I think I'm in the right zone, but there's a need for you guys, if you want to start reaching out to the juvenile, um, about the juvenile detention center called the Donald E. Long Detention Center. There's $222,000 that's needed in addition to what is currently being budgeted for them. There's a meeting tomorrow at 1 p.m. online. You can go to the MESD website and link up with it. Pretty important stuff, especially if equity means something to you. Unfortunately, our students of color are disproportionately placed in these places and there's not enough staff right now. There's a huge staff shortage. So if you have any interest in that area, please um, reach out to your legislators and let them know you'd like to see more money put in there so we can get some serious um, corrective um, support for our students. That's all I have. Uh, moving right along, we have next on our agenda, our school boundary modification discussion. Cindy's gonna lead us in this. This is a discussion, but correct me if I'm wrong, Matt, we could turn this into an action if we decide, am I correct? Yes, you can always, uh, with a separate board vote, uh, turn a discussion item into an action item. Excellent. Well, we're beginning this with discussion, so Cindy will lead us with that. Yes, thank you. Um, in your packet, uh, you have superintendent's recommendation. Um, as background information, um, the board approved the uh, boundary changes on the east side of our district and the current Clackamas feeder system in the um, spring, actually in June of 2018. Um, at that time, or just closely thereafter, we did hear from a particular group of parents uh, in a corner of the district that asked if they could appeal um, that decision uh, in their particular area. Um, because the boundary changes were going to be implemented in two phases, the first phase was the fall of 2019 when we opened up Beatrice Morrow Kennedy. And that only affected um, three small portions of uh, elementary schools at that time in order to populate that school. The rest of the boundary changes in phase two, much larger portion of our district will be affected by those changes. Comes uh, this coming fall in 2021, 
when we open up Adrian C. Nelson High School and realign all of the feeders. So uh, Rock Creek will move to the east campus of Clackamas. Clackamas will shrink back to one campus on the west campus. And then in order to make all those feeder patterns work, um, all of our elementary schools except one will also have some additional changes to the boundaries. Um, that has all been communicated multiple times to all of the families, all of the school staff and principals. Um, but the only appeal that we received at that time was from a particular community uh, that is south of the Carver Bridge or the uh, in uh, the Clackamas River. So south of the Clackamas River uh, in the Carver area. Um, these are all Oregon City addresses, but they are part of North Clackamas School District. We did ask at that time if we could hold the appeal until we are closer to the second phase of the boundary changes so that we might have a little bit more data to go on. We knew a traffic light was going to be put in at that bridge, uh, yet it had not been put in place when these boundary changes were made. We knew that could be a game changer, but we just did not have it in place to be able to see for sure. Transportation was a major factor um, and in, in contribution from our transportation department, uh, knowing that many times they have to travel along the Clackamas River, uh, Clackamas River Drive to uh, the freeways to get students back out into Clackamas when they could not turn left there. That was one major factor. Another major factor, um, the area was growing considerably around Duncan, uh, not knowing exactly how our enrollment would be affected. We were very concerned about the capacity for that school to continue to house as many students and to educate as many students in that school as, as it was a, a, uh, possibly going to be foreseen. Um, we just haven't seen all of those numbers completely come to fruition. Um, a lot of the, the growth that has been happening out there has turned into some apartment complexes, some senior living centers, and some commercial properties, in addition to some lots of residential, uh, but they just have not um, pro uh, produced the amount of students that we were concerned about at that time. Enrollment is a little bit of a, of a target uh, right now in the dark as our enrollment has dropped as parents have found other ways to uh, provide education for their students during this pandemic. But we do believe that Duncan would have the capacity. So we are asking that um, you take into consideration uh, adjusting this one corner of the boundaries uh, for the 2021 change that would uh, allow these families in that area in Carver, south of the Clackamas River, to remain at Duncan Elementary School and then carry on to its new feeder pattern, which would be Happy Valley Middle School and then to Adrian C. Nelson High School. Excellent, thank you, Cindy. Um, so discussion, uh, Director Schrader. Uh, I you know, I, I actually would just make a motion to uh, move this from a discussion item to an action item. Okay, do I have a second? Second. second. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. I heard Director Way, so it's been properly moved and second. Um, any discussion about that motion? Although I agree with the recommendation of, and I did, <coughs> I have a, I don't know if we should rush the process. There could be families that we haven't heard from that would like to voice their opinion on why the, we shouldn't go forward with this recommendation. And since we're not moving into comprehensive, we're still in a comprehensive district learning for the foreseeable future, I'm not sure why we would need to rush this unless superintendent knows something that I'm not aware of why we would need to get this decision made tonight. Yeah, um, we don't need to make the decision tonight. Uh, it is scheduled to be on the January, I think 14th uh, <laughs> agenda for action. Um, and so uh, there is time. There is no no immediate deadline. And although, and just my one opinion, I totally agree with the recommendation. And um, I just would hate for families or families to say they didn't have a chance to voice their opinion about changing of a boundary on a. They saw that it was a discussion item tonight, and they might not have came. So I don't know. Just my thoughts. I don't know if anyone else thinks that way or not. So at this point, just for clarity, we do have a motion on the floor, which has been um, properly second. So all this is discussion. You can have discussion on the recommendation or on the comments that Tori has made, but we will go to a vote as it is on the table. Um, unless someone wants to amend and really test my Robert's rules right now. 
But any other discussion? <laughs> I just had a quick question. Do we have any information on how that's going to affect the SES or um, the, the SPED numbers in that or ELL? Because I know um, that was a huge, I, I understand. I was on the boundary committee and I do know there was a lot of robust discussion and a lot of it really did evolve around the traffic uh, because there was real concern with transportation about that Carver Bridge. Uh, but I also know uh, from watching one street be moved and placed somewhere else that those SES numbers could be greatly affected. Um, so do we have any information about what, um, and I know that standing is only for who is there right now at the moment, but do we have any of that information? Um, the only thing I anecdotally and, and just number wise, um, th this uh, move affects 49 students who are mm -hmm. currently in the system. Now this change would be uh, into any future boundary changes, right? So any students moving into that area also would be uh, affected in the future. So out of 49 students, um, we have uh, a third of those at the elementary school um, and a handful at the middle and the rest are at high school. And so when you spread those 49 across three different schools, nice. um, it really does not affect much at all. Um, and I know out of the 49, there is only one English language learner um, that we uh, <coughs> translation for. Uh, other than that, um, I don't have specific details around special ed uh, programming. Or <coughs> I don't think it would be a huge change with 49 students. Okay, thank you for the clarification. I appreciate that. Other discussion? Um, Chair Ford, I, um, I do support the recommendation. I think um, board member McVeigh did have a, a good point that, and what you know, of course, the, our next discussion, our next meeting isn't until what January. Correct. But January fourteenth to be exact. I'm oh, okay. Okay. Um, I could go either way. You know, I I think. Um, you know, the announcement was made that we were discussing it. Um, so they had the right to, and there were notices that went to all the families. Is that correct? Correct. Um, both, uh, there were three different email messages um, that went to each family on this topic. The most recent one for transparency did say that this was a discussion item tonight that you were scheduled to take action in January. So the, the email did uh, say that. Um, but it is the, bur the board's purview to change those at your will. Director Schradel, I uh, haven't done this in a long time, so I really just withdraw my motion. Oh, where's my book at? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't want to do this to you. I didn't. I have a follow up for um, uh, Director um, Dutchin as well. Question. Um, okay, so if we could. Because a withdrawal, doesn't that require a vote anyway? It, it, it kind of does. You know, yeah. I, I want to make sure the community knows. I, I'm in support of this passing. It's two and a half years in coming. Right. Uh, it it uh, benefits that area, the rural community. And there was a survey done. And, you know, there's a, been a lot of, there, nobody would be surprised by it. But January is not that far away. Yeah. And so, they thought about the naming committee, didn't want to be surprised either. And then we heard that the community wasn't informed. <laughs> so I just worry about rushing any process. Yeah. Um, so I definitely understand that. But based on the process, if we are all in consensus that we're ready to vote on the motion, can we then do that and return to discussion for clarity? Director Ford, can we go for Sorry, Director Schrado. I just I don't like I don't like it when things uh, you know positive things don't pass. I was just trying to think of Robert's rules as it relates. Chair Ford. Yes. I do believe that if the motion is withdrawn, it can be taken off the table. As long as it's withdrawn by the mover. By the mover. Mm -hmm. right. And okay. if the second also withdraws, then it can just be taken off. Cool. I withdraw. Um, perfect. So it's been properly withdrawn from the 
mover and the second, or if that's a word, I just made it up if it's not. But um, <laughs> so we are now officially moving back to discussion only regarding the um, school boundary modifications presented by Cindy. Any other discussion? Chair, so I just, my quick question was, we just heard from um, Kathy, one of the parents that uh, maybe about 68% of families have already responded back. Um, I, I just wanted, I don't know what the official numbers are. Um, it, it, so I don't know if um, Cindy, you do you have any information on, um, is it more than half that have responded back? Or are there folks who we should still hear from? Yes, we've heard uh, 31 out of the 49 uh, responded to the survey. Um, and so we do have that information. 21 um, wanted this appeal to happen uh, tonight. 10 said, no, just leave it as is. And 18 did not respond to the survey. Uh, and just for uh, your information, we did email the survey. We sent it in US uh, postal mail service. So it went to their, um, their mailbox on their street as well, or their PO box. Um, and then we did a follow-up email and then phone called those that may have had some information in the survey that was not quite clear. Sometimes one parent would fill it out and say one thing and then another parent of the same child would fill it out and say a different thing. And we couldn't tell if that was in, in, in which one that they wanted to stick. And so um, there were phone calls made as well. Thank you. Yeah, it sounds like we're doing a very thorough job with the outreach. So I just appreciate that. Yeah, it's a smaller sample size. So I think it's a little easier for the team to kind of do the due diligence. And so appreciate it. Um, any other discussion on this area? I look forward to voting yes for this next time it's up for an action item. Perfect. So I'm just looking for consensus that we're okay with moving on. Cool. Excellent. Um, next thing on the agenda is the new course proposal. This is the discussion item. Petra, uh, are you of, are you ready? I see. Yes. You. Bright and sunny. I love <laughs> it. That's great. I love seeing different backgrounds. I think that it's awesome. I mean, you know, it's a little invasive because you probably see more than people want, but you know, hey, pick a well, good- Well, and you also have to be careful of where you're sitting, right? You know, and you don't end up having junk somewhere or, you know. <laughs> or you wind up looking like you're in witness protection because you're in the wrong <laughs> section. So good lighting, good lighting for you. All right, what do you got for us? All right, well, uh, good evening directors. I'm really happy to be here. It is course proposal time, which seems crazy but um, we do this at this time of the year so that we can really begin planning for um, implementation in the next school year, which will be upon us like before we even know it. Um, I have a team of folks with me today. So um, in sort of order of presenters, I have Tammy O'Neill. She's associate director of high school programs, uh, formerly principal at Clackamas High School. So you've seen Tammy. Um, I also have Marilyn Mee here. She is the assistant principal at Milwaukee High School. Andrew Guilford, assistant principal at Clackamas High School. And Greg Harris, he is the principal of our new Adrian C. Nelson High School. So they're gonna be helping me talk today about the AP Advanced Placement Capstone Program. So I am responsible for sharing my screen. And last time, it took me a second, so I'm going to be asking to see if everybody can see what they're supposed to be seeing. Let's see. All right, yeah. how does that look? Looks great. Excellent, love it. All right, so I'm gonna start us off. And uh, when we talk as a group in uh, of high school folks about course proposals, there are quite a few things that we consider. Uh, one, we feel that we all need to be on the same page in supporting any new courses that we offer students. Uh, so it is not a matter of, you know, one building deciding that they want to institute something and other buildings feeling like that, you, that wouldn't work in terms, of, um, in terms of our entire system. So that's always an important piece. Uh, in terms of the AP Capstone program, we've actually been talking about that uh, for more than a year. Uh, we have three AP schools right now, Milwaukee High School, 
and Clackamas High School and Adrian C. Nelson will have an AP program. So um, Tammy will be talking more about the overview of this program and the two courses with an AP capstone, which are the uh, seminar class and the research class. But um, the reason that we're bringing them to you today is because we believe that it uh, is part of a comprehensive pathway for our AP program, um, that it provides additional access uh, for students uh, for a diploma program. Uh, as uh, you know, over at Rex Putnam, they have the International Baccalaureate and they've had a diploma program for some time. So this provides our AP high schools an opportunity for diploma as well. Um, we also believe that these are excellent courses to support college preparation for our students. And, and it's not just about some students, it's about all students. Uh, we've been working very closely with uh, equal opportunity schools uh, in, in, uh, in which the mission is, is to ensure that the students that we have historically underserved are ensured access and um, are ready for any post-secondary opportunities that they wish to pursue. So I am going to be in charge of the slides and I'm going to uh, have Tammy give us more of an overview on what these courses are about and what the diploma program is about. Uh, so Marilyn is going to talk about the seminar course in particular. Andrew will talk about the research course. I get to talk about money. Uh, especially anything that is connected with Measure 98 is, uh, is my deal to talk about. And then Greg is going to talk about equity and access within this program. All right, Tammy. All right. Good evening, everybody. Um, so the two courses you'll be hearing, uh, hearing more about in the next couple of slides are going to provide Milwaukee, Clackamas, and Adrian C. Nelson High School students access to the Advanced Placement Capstone Diploma Program. So students who score a three or higher on four AP classes of their choice and in both the AP Seminar and the AP Research course will earn that recognition. The AP Seminar and Research courses are designed to complement the other AP courses in our schools. Their benefit is not only college preparation, but also strengthening the foundational academic skills and therefore the confidence needed for success in subsequent AP courses. They, uh, both of these courses were developed actually with an eye towards teaching kids how to complete college level coursework and not only on the learning that college level material like the other AP courses offer. They teach students how to tap into their interests and passions uh, while they build their critical thinking and research collaboration and time management and presentation skills that they'll need um, for any post-secondary uh, endeavor. And actually, you know, those skills that we recognize as being uh, kids being future ready. Um, altogether, the addition of these two courses to our high school's offerings will provide our kids opportunities to showcase their hard work uh, in preparing themselves for whatever future endeavor um, they're interested in. All right, um, the AP seminar actually is the first course of this program. It is a foundational course that in, uh, engage students in the cross curricular conversations that explore the complexity of academic and the real world topics and issues by analyzing divergent uh, perspectives. And using the inquiry uh, framework, students participate in reading and they're analyzing articles, research studies, and the foundational literary and uh, philosophical texts listen to and uh, uh, viewing uh, speeches and the broadcasts and the personal accounts and experiencing artistic works in the performances. So students will learn to synthesize information from multiple sources, develop their own perspective in research-based written essays and design and deliver oral and 
visual uh, presentations, um, both individually and as a part of a team. So ultimately, this course aims to uh, equip students with the power to analyze and evaluate the information um, with accuracy and persistency in order to craft and to communicate um, evidence-based arguments. And this course um, is a year-long course, and the student will uh, have some uh, uh, assessment of, uh, from the two different kinds of uh, uh, assessment. One is a format, uh, one is the uh, presentation, and uh, it can be team presentation and individual. Another one is individuals. Uh, research-based essay and uh, presentation. And the last one, they will take a um, end of the course exam. So that will be required for this course. Thank you. All right, Andrew. Sorry, I realized I was... <laughs> Speaking away, and I hadn't unmuted yet. Um, <laughs> um, the, the research course, which happens in the second year of the program, um, is a, a realization of the skills that are developed um, in the AP seminar class and um, an application of the content um, that is learned in the additional AP classes that students are taking um, who are part of the AP capstone program. Um, the key element of the advanced placement research class is independent research. Um, those of you that have been around a number of years may recall senior seminar uh, that we used to do in which students were able to um, pick a topic that they are passionate about and that comes from their interests and then pursue that topic in a deep fashion. Um, this is similar to that. Um, with a focus on research and a focus on research that's done using the tools and the methods of the discipline that research is done in. So whereas an AP seminar, they're really honing their writing skills and their analysis skills and their ability to synthesize a variety of information, they're taking those skills then and applying it and, and doing original research. Um, I was lucky that uh, a number of years ago, six years ago, I was able to teach the um, AP research course in, in its pilot year. And I just wanted to share with you some of the examples of research projects that students conducted during that year. Um, we had one student who um, looked at a variety of models that were being used in refugee camps to educate the children in those camps. Um, and based upon comparing those models, developed a new one um, she was able to share with a local nonprofit that she was working with as a potential approach for uh, education of children in refugee camps. Um, another student um, developed a methodology to actually use um, 3D printers to create cheap and um, rapidly made prosthetic limbs for individuals in, um, in less developed countries. Um, another student uh, did a psychology research experiment where they looked at um, the effect of priming on individuals and how by priming individuals, you can actually have an impact on their success while playing cooperative games. Um, all of these had to, all these students had to do first, obviously a review of the information already known in those areas, um, a learning of the methodologies that were in those areas, um, and then um, do the actual research, write it up and present it to a panel. Um, it al almost has a feeling of a mini PhD, but with a tremendous amount of guidance along the way. Students form relationships with community partners um, and students, I, in an ideal situation, students, um, the work that they're doing has, has an impact on the broader community that they are working with. Um, and like I said earlier, really that the, the skills learned um, both in the seminar and the research class are ones that they can leverage and apply to research opportunities and research experiences that they'll expected to have um, in their next steps beyond high school. All right, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about money. 
Um, we feel very fortunate that Measure 98 is going to be fully funded and that news is relatively new, but some of this planning um, really uh, has, you know, we've been thinking very carefully about how we might do this, even if we didn't have as much in terms of Measure 98 dollars. Um, staffing is often supported by the enrollment in a school, depending on um, how the, the bigger picture budget looks. But uh, in this uh, case, we're able to really support the start of these courses and this programming with some FTE from Measure 98 in order to make sure that it's not a burden on the school to be able to run the course. So for the first year, we will um, provide that FTE as well as um, one period worth of planning and um, sort of coordination to help us really develop these courses and to uh, develop the entire pathway and um, support the diploma program. Additionally, there are, will be some needs for training um, through the college board that Measure 98 will support and any supplemental texts and materials, we will be able to use those funds as well. So in the, um, it's a, it will be relatively inexpensive in the initial, um, in the initial years and actually not particularly expensive at all in future years. It is, um, that is a nice thing about uh, the AP, you know, pathway is um, that it is something that becomes very doable for schools to be able to manage. Hi, good evening, everybody. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about equity and access. Um, and I could talk uh, a lot about this. Um, it's really the heart of our course proposal, but I've been asked to keep uh, everything brief. So I will <laughs> attempt to do that as much as possible. Um, just speaking from experience, I think that we have made um, some huge gains in access, equitable access to AP programs. Um, that started with um, eliminating the, the requirements, all of the prerequisites and all of the, all of the things that kids had to do in order to take an AP class. And we decided that a student wishing to take the challenge is all the prerequisite that was needed for an AP class. Um, the issue still remains though, that a lot of our um, that we don't see the diversity in our AP classes oftentimes because students don't see themselves as an AP student. Um, the thing I love about the capstone as I'm learning about what it looks like is that these classes offer a exploration and offered a lot of opportunity for students to look at things that they're interested in and doesn't necessarily tie it down to one particular content level. So a student doesn't need to see themselves as an advanced science student or an advanced math student. They could see themselves as somebody who is interested in research and interested in their own topics and learn how to do that. Um, a student that's taking these classes, they build the skills. And more importantly to me though, they build the confidence to see themselves in spaces that are often seen as white spaces and upper class spaces. Um, and then they can find confidence and success in that and be able to continue, continue along that path. Um, of course, Prepare, uh, graduating students is not really the goal. Graduating students who are prepared for opportunities in the future, that's the goal. Um, and then the capstone offers a, a, a jump start into that. Students who are taking the, who, students who finish the capstone are better prepared for college. Um, they're able to do the rigorous research required in a four-year university um, quicker um, than their peers. And so really preparing students through graduation into post-secondary, if that's where they wanna go. And so really it goes on and on and on, but really the foundation for equity is there. All right, so we're happy to answer any questions that uh, you may have. And um, well, we, we were actually, we were pretty quick and concise, not nice job team. <laughs> Excellent, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, can we close that, the sharing and then I can see the, the crew Thank you very much. Thank you guys for that presentation. And um, I really was listening, Greg, but that refrigerator is just pretty darn awesome behind you. Um, just saying. Okay, Director Shredo, you have anything you would like to say or ask? Great presentation. I don't have any questions. Thank you. Excellent. Director Perez? Yeah, I echo what uh, Director Shredo said. That was an awesome presentation. Thank you so much. Excellent. 
Director Benaloga. Yes, thank you, Chair Ford. I um, thank you for the presentation. It's very exciting to see this brought to our district. I just had two questions. I noticed that it says that the seminar is the prerequisite to the research. So does that mean that if we have a senior um, that maybe didn't think they could do it, are they not able to do both of those their senior year? They can do the uh, concurrent enrollment. They can do oh. it at the same time. Okay, excellent. Thank you. And then has there been any, again, I, I appreciate your thoughts, Greg, that a lot of times we're talking about kids that don't see themselves in this space. Um, has there been thought to how we're going to work with and talk to and encourage, um, you know, maybe even eighth, ninth and 10th graders to get involved in this and, and letting their families know about this opportunity? Yeah, Andrew and I have spent a lot of time talking about that, and Andrew's done a great job um, talking with the counseling department too, um, because it's the it's the marketing aspect of it. Yeah, um, because that's our job to help students see themselves in that space, and that's definitely on our mind. Um, as soon as we go through the course proposal, the way that we present this to our students and our community will definitely be uh, one of equitable access. And I appreciate the work that Andrew's done on that. All right, excellent. Thank you, and thank you again for the presentation. And Director McVeigh. I have a couple questions. Does this replace the AP Honors Program or it's in addition to for a diploma? Yes, before um, with the AP program, uh, the students would take however many AP classes that they wanted and whatever content area they were interested in but it is only really recently that they've developed out a, a diploma program kind of similar to what IB does. So this is sort of an expansion of a, um, the program that has already been in place. Uh, anything I'm missing from the team that you wanna to add to that? Yeah, I would, I would just uh, piggyback mm -hmm. on there. This does not replace the North Clackamas Honors Diploma. It's so. in addition to? Correct. Okay. Um, Will there be any weighting changes in grades? So is the APA the same as a non-APA? Um, we're currently, you know, any weighting changes that happen um, would be for any course such as in an IB or AP. So that would, this particular program is not changing any weighting. Okay. And then the last part, um, I'm, when we talk about um, if we if, if kids aren't pathed correctly, almost in fifth grade, so they go in middle school knowing what math they need to take, so they can get into freshman algebra, then they're not allowed entry into AP courses. By the time they don't have enough to get into those required classes, so back to what Greg you were saying earlier, are we eliminating all those requirements to get into AP classes, or just into these new courses being presented tonight? Um, it had, I, I think historically in a lot of places, I'm not necessarily talking about North Clackamas, it's been really common for AP courses like maybe um, AP uh, Lit and Comp or AP Psychology or whatever it happens to be that a student has to have a certain grade in a class or a student has had to take something. And those put up barriers. Uh, because we're deciding what a student is or is not capable of when we do that. So it has not been our practice to put barriers up for some time. And that has been changing in a lot of places in the country. So um, the, the goal is to have these courses as accessible as possible for students and not only accessible, but that we're encouraging students to pursue them and to support them in that coursework. So this sort of expands on um, our, our philosophy on increasing access and removing as many barriers as possible. Super great, thank you. Director Wei. Um, thank you again for the presentation. I um, am just so happy and excited to see this new addition um, to courses for our students. And I really um, 
thank um, Andrew in particular for a lot of the examples that you brought about, you know, how some of the um, previous students have really been able to, to um, you know, apply just so many uh, things to the real world. And I, I would love to look back, you know, five, 10 years from now and say, a North Clackamas student took this class and now they were able to find the cure for cancer or, you know, they were able to find, right, um, they were able to create an invention because of the coursework that they um, took in our school district. So um, that makes me happy and proud as a school board member to see that we are making some really significant ways to help all students um, in various social economic situations um, really overcome a lot of challenges and barriers. So thank you again so much. And um, I look forward to hearing a lot of positive success stories from our graduates um, after high school. One of the aspects of the research class is that students need to do a, uh, a defense of their research to a panel. So uh, I look forward to inviting board members to be part of that panel. Uh, and if not that, then certainly bringing students to the board to share some of the work that they have done. That's excellent. Thank you. And I know that, you know, I think for a lot of first generation college students, um, or even those who have maybe have never thought about college anything before in their lives, this is really one way that we are opening the door of possibility for them um, is to, um, you know, make even the word research, right, sound less scary and intimidating and more, um, more palatable um, to where they're at in life. So again, thank you. This is great. Cool. Uh, Director Bauer. Great comments, um, previous board members. I can't add too much to that, except I'm excited about this. And I think you have your finger on it when you said, you know, you eliminate barriers, all prerequisites are eliminated. Cause I can think of my own children and they were very different. And one did not see himself that way at all, but um, he was strongly encouraged to challenge himself. And a lot of kids don't have that, you know, and I think you're laying that framework um, of eliminating and encouraging, eliminating barriers and encouraging. Um, critical thinking is so important. And I love that, that, that uh, phrase that you're teaching that we need that so badly in our society today. But thank you for this great work. Thank you guys. I just have uh, one question and three comments. So, um, I, I was wondering if this, if these courses will be on a student's list for forecasting or will it be separated? Yeah, students will be able to, well, for the first year, it'll be the seminar class. So the okay. research class will come the year after. So for this next year, students will be able to uh, opt into the seminar class. It will, we'll need to do some, uh, educating of students of what this is, as well as teachers and counselors. There has been conversation with staff um, already about, about these courses, but the, the real job is, is to helping to, you know, helping students to understand what they are, what that course can do for them and, um, and give them the opportunity to opt in. Cool. Um, and then my other, uh, my comments are two things. So we, we talked a lot about access and equity, which I totally appreciate. But I definitely think there needs to be some, um, some I guess, learning and education opportunities for family to understand how this contributes to a, um, a college um, scholarship in a way, um, that it potentially becomes college dollars and really helping them equate the dollars to the course may be a helpful way for people to opt in faster. If I see that early, maybe then I understand it earlier, but not just telling a kid like this may help you in college, like giving them concrete dollars. Like this is the credit hour cost. This course just took away this cost um, and making it really kind of concrete for them. So that was one thought I had. And the other thought I had is some of the committees I sit on, we, we talk to, a, there's a lot of push right now for collaborating across and cross pollinating systems. And so we all know K through 12 systems have some work to do, but they're better. And then you get the college and it's this whole new system. 
And um, I heard the comment made that, you know, preparing kids for school. But one of the things that we're really pushing is colleges preparing for kids because um, it's very, it's, it's a wrong way to think that a kid should be ready for college. They should be ready for them in particular with the pandemic happening, they're gonna be a different kid. And so with that, I encourage you, if you have access to, to universities around here, whatever you guys are doing, push it to them so they know what's coming and they can prepare for them versus setting up a 17 year old, 18 year old to just be ready for life. That's all I have. Appreciate you guys. Great presentation. Um, really appreciate all the, the work that you guys are doing over there. It's exciting to have this new addition in our district. Just makes us that much better. Thank you guys. All right. Thank you so much. Yeah. Next on our agenda is policy revisions. Miss Tiffany. I'm here tonight. Uh, good Hello. evening, everybody. Uh, thank you uh, for the consent agenda approval earlier tonight on uh, policies. I'm bringing forward to you tonight two policies for discussion. These are discussion only uh, tonight at this point and um, are scheduled to come back for action at your next board meeting in January. Uh, these two policies are related to the passage in 2019 of Senate Bill 155. Uh, this is a bill that we've referenced a few times uh, and is a bill specifically uh, focused on increasing protections for students and enhanced requirements for school districts related to sexual mis misconduct and sexual abuse. So this, these two uh, policies specifically have more explicit direction to school districts and uh, Senate Bill 155 gave us more explicit direction about how we handle uh, allegations of misconduct by adults, particularly of a sexual nature. Uh, the two policies specifically address that all charges resulting in disciplinary action uh, shall be considered a permanent part of a certified educator's personnel file. Um, this is in response, of course, to um, what could be said as uh, decades or a, a history in educational institutions of um, disciplinary actions not making it all the way into personnel files. Um, and then there's no institutional knowledge or history of those. Uh, also, uh, this discuss, uh, the policy discusses how uh, uh, the school district releases personnel records when releases are, or requests are received. Um, this is all in that realm of making sure that if someone has been um, party, uh, a, a, a perpetrator, I guess one could say, of sexual misconduct or sexual child abuse, um, and they are an educator, uh, that that could never be brushed under, under the rug. Okay. So those, these are the two policies. I am here to uh, answer any questions should you have them. Excellent, I can see you all. So if you have a question, um, just go ahead and uh, you can either raise your hand or put it, I'll, I'll acknowledge you and then we'll move forward. Oh, Director Bauer. I just had one quick question. So um, does this policy also help prevent hiring of new employees with past? Hmm, I need to think, I need to dig into the policy a little bit. Um, only in so much as that uh, there is a requirement uh, that we as a school district um, uh, check with the previous employers. And now the previous employers are compelled to respond in the state employer. I mean, of course, this is a state law, um, but they are compelled to respond any educational uh, provider uh, within 20 days um, to us. So. There are some pieces in that regard. I'd probably have to look to Mark. I'm not positive that it's this particular policy. Yeah, that I didn't see it. I didn't think I saw it here, but I, I wondered if, if it was and I missed it. It's kind of, it kind of alludes to it um, when it speaks of there to be an exchange of information between a school district and say TSPC or ODE because they might be investigating someone and they will, they have the ability, and that's in the policy, one of the two policies, to uh, retrieve that information from that school district. That information will be used in a database that we're currently using, and that's all part of Senate Bill 155 that we have to refer to 
to see if there's any one that we're wanting to hire that's under investigation uh, or has had some substantiated claim against them for sexual misconduct or uh, sexual child abuse. Great, thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Mark. Any other questions or discussion needed? Well, seeing none, you guys did a great job. Clearly, it's so clear. No one has questions. Thank you, Tiffany. We'll be back. Thanks. We'll come back January to um, have this as an action item. January 14th, to be exact. Uh, next on our list is OSBA elections. Superintendent Utterback is our presenter. Yep, I'll bring us home tonight uh, with two action agenda items. The first is the Oregon School Boards Association uh, annual um, uh, board position elections. And so tonight uh, you are seeing uh, recommendations or considerations for OSBA uh, board position seven, uh, which is Liz Hartman. Uh, she's the only candidate. Uh, OSBA position eight, uh, which is Libra Ford, also the only candidate. And then one resolution tonight, and that is the adoption of the proposed 2021-22 OSBA legislative priorities and principles. I would recommend that we do three separate motions um, on uh, each of those items. Excellent. So we'll start with the first one, which is regarding uh, position seven. Is it region seven or position region seven, right? Uh, position seven. Position seven, okay. Of OSBA board, do I hear a, a motion? This way, I make a motion to uh, uh, adopt the OSBA position um, number seven for Liz Hartman. McVeigh, second. And properly moved and second. Any discussion? Okay, seeing none, we'll do a roundabout vote. Director McVeigh. With the way. <laughs> oh, me. Sorry. Right yeah, sorry. I was <laughs> okay. My D's and W's mixed up. <laughs> it's okay. McWay, that could be a, a combination there. Yeah, it is. <laughs> you made a whole new board member. <laughs> um, I. Way. Okay. Director McVay. Aye. Director Beneloga. Oops. Aye. Director Bauer. Aye. Director Perez. Aye. And Director Schrado. Aye. Okay, our second one is for position eight. Go ahead, Christian. McVeigh, I recommend uh, Libra Ford for OSBA board position eight. Our Perez, second. second. Ah, I beat you. <laughs> Probably moved by McVeigh, seconded by Bauer. Uh, any discussion needed? Thank um, you. I Yes. I'm Echoing okay. Director Bauer, I just want to thank um, Chair Ford for again stepping up and um, leading our district and our community in so many ways, including this new role. So thank you. Appreciate that. Cool. Let's do a vote. Director Schrado. Aye. Director Perez. Aye. Director Bauer. Aye. Director Beneloga. Aye. Director McVeigh. Aye. And Director Way. Aye. Excellent. Um, and then the resolution. This is Bauer. I move to approve Revolution One, Resolution One, to adopt the proposed 2021 22 OSBA legislative priorities and principles. Just so you know, we're getting late. We're all it's just time to go to bed. Yeah. I want to start a revolution. <laughs> I support that. Do we have a second? <laughs> second. Excellent. Properly moving a second. Any needed discussion? Me. <laughs> okay. Let's vote. Director Schrader. Uh, aye. Director Perez. Aye. Director Bauer. Aye. Director Beneloga. Aye. Director McVeigh. Aye. Derek DeWay. Aye. And I'm also aye. I don't think I voted on the last two. Sorry, Sandra. <laughs> <laughs> My bad. 
<laughs> All right, moving into so, our uh, point of order. Do you want those to be abstentions? No, they're Ooh. both eyes. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I just realized that when I got to the third one. <laughs> okay, uh, next agenda item and the final one is our superintendent evaluation processes as an action item. Uh, Superintendent Utterback. Yes, you saw the timeline and the process uh, at your last board meeting. Superintendent's recommendation is to adopt the evaluation process uh, for the superintendent's evaluation. Open the floor for a motion. Bauer, I move to approve, adopt the evaluation process for the superintendent's evaluation. Make a second. Oh, sorry, Stephen, you take it. Been properly moved by Director Bauer and seconded by Director Schrado. Uh, any discussion needed? We have done this so many times. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Director Schrado, how do you vote? Aye. Director Perez? Aye. Director Bauer? Aye. Director Benaloga? Aye. Director McVeigh? Aye. Director Way. Aye. And I am I because it's Groundhog Day. We have voted on that so many times. All right, that is it. It is 836, one minute after the hour of when we were supposed to adjourn. And before we go, you guys be kind to each other, be kind to yourself. And remember, community is everything. We do this together, we win together. All right, y'all, we're adjourned. See you next hey, time. Gina. Hey, Gina, yeah, your uh, background. Every time I look at you, it's the like, honey, I shrunk the kids. Like you're inside the Christmas. <laughs> well, good. I'm glad to meet you, Chuckle. <laughs> it is. It, it, I just can't keep a stop smiling every time I see it. I love that background. Oh, 